You know, we have Loretta Chen today here on Think Tech, here on Community Matters. Um, and we're, we're, uh, we have Loretta Chen, and she is a crazy rich Asian. Am I right? I a crazy right? rich in spirit Asian. Yes, sir. Okay, because <laughs> all the people in Singapore are like that, aren't they? Uh, well, uh, some richer in spirit than others. <laughs> some richer in their pockets than okay, others. All right. I think well, we have like the largest number of millionaires per capita, I think. Ah, okay. So I think you're onto something. She's from Singapore. You wouldn't know it necessarily. <laughs> And now she's teaching at Leeward Community College. Yes, sir, you are in, right. In theater and various other things. And she's an author, too. And we're going to focus mostly today on, on, on her authoring. So you wrote a number of books, Loretta, about women. Why? Yes, sir. I mean, first off, whoa, first off, I am woman, hear me raw. Right, that's me. I'm like, I, I feel like there is no better way for me to put my stories out there if I don't speak from my own body, my own experience. Uh, and I think that that's always the best place to start from because I think I have greater depth of experience than, say, if I try to write about your life. So I think that was how I got started. Um, being, you know, uh, having my stories to tell or people asking me to tell my story. And that led to me being really curious about other people's stories. And the more I went down that rabbit hole, uh, I think the books just grew. And, and now we're on to our fourth book, Inspiring fourth book. Women of Hawaii. Okay, well, let's talk, about, let's talk about the first three real quick. What yes, do you sir. got? And if we have, you want to look at some slides on this? Sure. Okay, what do we got? So the first book um, is called Women on Top. Ha <laughs> ha. Maybe that's for a late night show. Well, when I taught the art of smashing stereotypes and breaking all the rules, and basically uh, because I'm a media personality in Singapore, and what I really wanted to do. What did you do to become a media personality uh, in Singapore? Oh, well, that's radio, a late, television, late night show. What? No, that's uh, so. A lot of it was uh, radio, TV, and the theater. The theater was where I really cut my teeth, um, told searing, controversial stories that mainstream media in Singapore did not quite allow. So that ah. was how I cut my teeth. And then I got recognized by brands that decided to ask me to helm their marketing campaigns because it's about connection. And this was way before social media. Um, so I found out. You don't out, look that old. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. I love it. Yeah. So, so this is way before social media. So I found a, a niche in being able to communicate messages to a live audience. So that was my medium. So to answer your question, yes, it was theater, radio, um, TV, but it was a theater that got my name out there, and then the marketing campaigns, and then the radio shows, and the TV appearances. Oh, wow, you were pretty active. You have yeah. a PhD, what's the subject? Uh, in critical theory, yeah. So critical got, theory, uh -huh. is it philosophy or Yeah, something? it is, it is a PhD, yeah, that's right, it's oh, a doctorate in philosophy. I always admire philosophy PhDs. It, can't, we just keep thinking about a whole lot of nothing, no, but having said no, that, no, it's, 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 it's grueling thought. thought process is it what is. it is. Yeah. It's, it's disciplined thought process. Yeah. I mean, I laugh at myself, but it's a disciplined process. Okay, so back to the first so back part, to the women first on top. So I wrote that because I really wanted to use my platform to inspire young women, because, and men. Uh, because I felt that, speaking as an Asian woman, um, there was a lot of shame. And people often felt embarrassed about owning up to their own issues or problems. Because I think in an Asian culture, we all need to look like a crazy rich Asian. <laughs> and so I felt like that's not right. Because I remember my niece coming home um, from school one day. She was asked to audition in a play. And she turned down that role because she was afraid that she would fail. And I thought, well, that's not right. I mean, she's a pretty smart, talented girl. And she has all this fear. Because there is this culture and climate where people just don't dare to talk about failure or loss. And, and where, it's, it's where a taboo in Singapore. We all need to look like we have these perfect social media lives. So I decided to use my platform to enable the discussion on the things that are taboo to Singaporeans, namely on failure, on, on not getting it always right. And I, so I used my platform to have those conversations. Um, so that was how that started, and that led to a TED talk, a, a TED talk called "Power Failure," which became quite popular. Oh, um, TED talk! Yeah. You gave a TED talk. Yeah, the, we always called, admire TED talk people. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> the power of failure. Um, and so then I, I wrote my second book uh, called "Driven by Purpose, Destined for Change," and in it I interviewed an entrepreneur because again I wanted to highlight or showcase or underscore the fact that. We don't always get things right the first time. Entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because they take risks. And taking risks mean you fail and sometimes Isn't you Isn't Singapore a place where people do take risks? They do take risks. They, they take calculated risk. And I think a lot of it of risks that people are comfortable talking about is financial monetary risks. But the kind of risk that I also wanted to enable a conversation on is emotional risks mental risks, taking risks on your beliefs, um, yeah. your social values. Have and. You, 
ego dash, whatnot. <laughs> right? And, and, I mean, get this. I mean, Singapore, we don't have freedom of speech. It's one of the things that we campaign and, and champion because we still don't have, um, we, there is a law called repeal, we're part of a team working on repeal 377A because um, homosexuality is still banned in Singapore. But it's not just homosexuality. I mean, it really is a subset of a bigger picture that not everyone is equal. Right, so I think as as artists, as educators, we're always <laughs> trying to fight um, for those um, changes. Um, so you know, America for me is a, a great place to be. I think it it, it I, when I was in UCLA, I think uh, it was my formative years. So I decided to come back in twenty fifteen. Uh, but that was that's my second book. Should I? Is this where I talk about my third book now? Yeah. This is where you talk about the third book. <laughs> so so I, I love that we're just all over the place. Uh, and then we come back to the point. Um, my third book is called Madonnas and Mavericks, Power Women in Singapore. And I had the uh, um, pleasure of interviewing 17 of the most illustrious women in Singapore, including our current president. Wow. Uh, she's the first Muslim female president, Halima Yaakob. Uh, and I realized that the readers were thrilled at reading the stories of these women because we asked them questions on their overcoming. Um, their struggles. It's not just about celebrating our success. Look at me, I'm so rich and beautiful and gorgeous, but these were all the hurdles I had to cross to get to where I am today. Um, and what I also asked of all the women was to contextualize for us the issues, the problems. Um, and that was hugely empowering because it allowed for a dialogue and conversation about then and now and about uh, the battles we have won and the battles we have to so still fight. These are, this, this is, this is a the model is yeah. you have women who are successful. You want to find out how they got to be successful. That's right. And you want to find out what, what they had to overcome to be successful. That's right. And, and how we narrow down that list, too. It's not your, your typical Forbes list of successful women about you know, how much money they make, but in the spheres of influence, whether it's in education or the arts or in sport. Um, or in advocacy. So it's a whole range um, of women, and it's a formula that I repeated for our fourth book sure. right here in Hawaii. You criticize them? Uh, respectfully. <laughs> I think to, to agree to disagree, because um, even in my third book, what I did was I had um, a president and incumbent politician um, of the ruling party, and I also had uh, the highest ranking member of the opposition party, you know, in the same book. Oh, no. and, 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 you know, <laughs> so you can read, obviously, uh, the differences in opinion. And of course, we leave the audience to, or the readers to make up their point of view. And for me as an author, uh, as an educator, as an artist, I feel like my role is to really create, connect, communicate, and mm -hmm. get their ideas and thoughts out as truthfully as I can. So and what's your MO in terms of, uh, um, hi, uh, Miss President, um, I'm, uh, I'm Loretta. I want to come over and spend the <laughs> afternoon with you. And I'm going to bring a little tape recorder. I'm going to bring my steno pad. And I'm going to take notes. And here's some of the questions I'm going to ask you. And this is why I'm writing the book. Something right on. Like kind yeah. of like how I accosted you too, right, Jay? You'll but like that. Yeah. <laughs> I am that way. I mean, I'm just like, I mean, I, I told myself I got, a, I got a roll of the punches and I better walk the talk. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm trying to go out there and urge, you know, young men and women to take risks, I better walk the talk. I can't just like hide behind all say. So I, I do that, and that's pretty much what I do. Are you famous there? Uh, uh, yeah, pretty much in, in Singapore, I think. It's one of those weird questions. I think someone else should answer it for me, not, but yeah. <laughs> okay, that, there's nobody else here. It's just you and me, Loretta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so now you've written three books yes, sir. about women. Yeah. Okay, and you're about to tell us about the fourth book, which is the one that's about to come out. Am I right? That's absolutely right, October okay. 21st. October 31st. 21st. That's very, yeah. Okay, that's very soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's also about women here in Hawaii, Nei, right? That's right. So why all these women? What about a man's book? Are, I want are we getting to, to that? We where, are, where is that in the, in the offing? We are getting to that. So I would come and accost you and say, Jay, would you allow me to come record you on my little um, iPhone? And you will say yes. So once I have you down, then the rest will fall in line. It would be very interesting. Okay, right? no, let's yeah, do that. So yeah, on okay, air. All right, okay, okay there we are. That's okay. an engagement. Yeah, put, all right, so okay. let's talk about the fourth book. What yes, is it, and, and uh, what is it, how is it different? Mm -hmm. I guess it's different because these are people in Hawaii, these are mm -hmm. women in Hawaii. But the same model, you find the same model and say hi, and I'm coming over this, <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> I'm coming over to you, and you don't even know me. I'm from Singapore, I'm from my other island. Um, 
Yes and no. I think, uh, yes, the, the MO is the same. No and that I'm writing from an outsider's perspective. I cannot visit to say that I'm a local girl. I'm writing because I have insider information and perspective the way you have. So I literally, let's take it back a, a notch. I mean, I came in 2015. Didn't know anybody except for Shirley Daniel. Uh, <laughs> okay. and, and She runs PAMI, the Pacific Asia Management Institute. Uh, and they uh, did a uh, show on uh, Paul Zucco. Yeah. Uh, who was a, a commandant? Who was the commandant of the Coast Guard last yeah. week in the in the Paul Chung Memorial Lecture yes. at the Hawaii Prince? And we took that, yeah. and we we saw Loretta. Not the first time, but we did see Loretta there. Yes, exactly. Okay. And I accosted you too. <laughs> yes. So you like that? <laughs> I am that way. Um, yeah. So anyhow, I, I I moved here because I I just had a calling. Like I, I had to be here, and and it proved me right because two weeks later I meet my now husband. And so Hawaii is now my home. So let's take that back a little bit. When I first came here, I had no idea what I was going to do. I just knew that I had a vision that my gifts were to create, connect, communicate. And so when I decided that Hawaii is going to be my home, I also decided that I had to go out there and get to know people. I mean, I could always be a stay-home tourist and go Google about Jay or go Google about what's happening at Waikiki or go read up, you know, um, what's on. Uh, but I felt that the best way for me to be connected with the community was to go out there, talk to people. My gift was writing, talking, listening. So I thought I was going to propose a book. Um, given my past experience and, and some successes, I took it to mutual publishing. So I got it all credit goes to them because here's this like crazy girl, crazy rich in spirit Asian girl <laughs> knocking at their door. And they're like, okay, we don't know why, but we just can't seem to say no to you. <laughs> so I think a they, lot of people feel that way, Laura. <laughs> so, so they say yes to me, and next thing I knew, they helped me narrow down the list of women that we should interview. And again, I think that was probably the ch most challenging process because we wanted everybody, but my criteria was I wanted them to be alive because I, I felt like we needed alive to. Alive is good. Yeah, I, I wanted to celebrate them when they were alive. You know. Um, I also wanted a range of ages because I felt that I mean. Having started my career young, I mean, I knew that I was, I don't want to say victim, but I was challenged by ageism, right? Because people looked at me like, we can't take you seriously because you're only, you know, 16. <laughs> um, but look at today. I mean, we have activists that are, you know, breaking down walls, you know, in, in high school and even younger. So I, that's what I told Mutual and the team, that I wanted a range of ages, and I, went, I wanted them to be across a range of spheres of influence. So not just the Connie Laos, who is in the book, not just Maisie Hirono, who is in the book, but I also wanted like Puan Nani uh, Burgess, who is an advocate. I also wanted Raya Helm, who is a native Hawaiian singer. Um, and we also have Kim Koko Iwamoto, who is a transgender politician and advocate. So I wanted a whole range of women. A lot of them have been here. Oh, yeah. 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 So I yeah. should interview you next time. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but that was really the biggest challenge, narrowing down um, the scope um, of women. Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> you showed me a list of some 24 yeah. women. This has to be the most ambitious book you've, you've uh, undertaken. <laughs> yes, actually. When I, when I did complete the manuscript, we had actually, I think, closer to 33 women. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but publisher said it's going to be like this thick, and no one, I mean, even if people wanted to read it, I mean, it's hard to lug this book around, and I mean, it won't make financial sense for them as well, because they were publishing it, you know, not me. I'd be like, let's go publish it. Um, so we had to, unfortunately, take out some stories. Um, that was the hardest part. That was the next hardest part to communicate that to my interviewees as well. Um, and we narrowed it down to, to 24 very uh, diverse, um, illustrious, and strong, strong women. Okay, Loretta Chen, when we get back from uh, our break, yes. we're going to start talking about some of them of interest. And I'll tell you why you remind me of Dave Heenan. Uh, Dave Heenan used to be the president of Theo H. Davies. He was the the dean of the, uh, of the uh, College of Business at UH Manoa. Huh. Okay. And most recently, he was a trustee of the Campbell Estate. Um, and he has written a lot of books. And when we come back, I'll tell you why you remind me of him. And it's not because he's a crazy, rich uh, Asian. <laughs> we'll be right back with Loretta Chen. <laughs> Aloha. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough of Sister Power here at Think Tech of IE. And Sister Power is all about motivating empowering, educating, and inspiring all people. And we have various subjects here. Sister Power is here at ThinkTech every other Thursday at 4 p.m. 
Again, my name is Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, host of Sister Power. We look forward to seeing you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at sistersempoweringhawaii at gmail.com. Look forward to chatting with you soon. Aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Okay, you did it again. You weren't around for the break. You didn't hear <laughs> what Loretta was saying during the break. But it was very interesting. It was about her secret sauce. Oh, yeah. And how she approaches people. You want to talk about that for a minute, Loretta? <laughs> I think it's just going in there with a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, guts and, 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 and not being, and not be afraid that they slam the door in your face and, then, and not being afraid to say, to, to take no for an answer. So if they say no, I'll say, oh, please, please don't say no. But if you say no, that's okay. I completely understand. I'm very respectful, but please it's don't say no. It's very important to be able to deal with, you know, rejection. Oh, rejection. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is that, that. It's actually the secret sauce, you know, being able to deal with rejection. And then, yeah. So Dave Heenan, who is a great guy, okay. uh, has written a number of books uh, about business leaders. Right. And, uh, and he, find, he finds a thread. They're both men and women, I might add. Sure. Uh, and he gives you a little bio sketch uh, or a story that happened in the life of the, these individuals, many of whom are famous on a national level. Right. And he, 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 he calls them up on the phone. He goes, he flies to meet them. Yeah. Um, he, he interviews them no matter what. And yeah. he writes these great books, a number of them, and we've talked to him about some of those books. Yeah. Anyway, so let's like talk me. about your new book. Yes, sir. Um, and um, uh, uh, I, first I want to I wanna ask you to read something out of it. Okay. So we can see we can see about your prose, Woo. Loretta. Woo. Wow, they're putting on the spot now. Whew. Wow. Um, the title take, of the book. The title of the book is "Inspiring Women of Hawaii." Okay. By Loretta Chen. Okay, okay. and okay. it's going to be on sale in, in October. October twenty-first uh, at Costco, Target, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. yeah, and everyone's invited to the launch party November 1st and at the YWCA. That's only the beginning, too. That's yeah, yeah, only yeah. the beginning. Hope yeah. you're ready for a bestseller. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I hope so. And, and, and truly, I think all these women have, have, have bared their souls and, and shared their, their, their secret sauce. Um, and some of them actually shared some very personal things that they have not shared ever before. Oh, so I want, I want that here. Okay. So let's talk about your prose. First of all, can you mm -hmm. describe for me why your prose is different from all the other prose in the world? First off, it's, it's my version of the world, but I think what I did with this book, uh, the slightly different too, was that all the women have such distinct voices. And if I had tried to encapsulate all their voices with my prose, because I have a very distinict voice from Singapore. I think so. Uh, and a completely different accent. I get thought letter as well, right? And it'll be like, throw them off completely. Um, I decided to use their voices, so I, I turned the format into a question and answer format where you uh, can hear my voice uh. as the interviewer. And I tried as best um, to capture their their prose, but of course I had to edit, I had to listen very thoroughly and clean up um, all the pukas and, and, and make all the links. And put the reader in the room. And put the reader in the room, right? Um, but I felt like that was the best way to do them justice because I didn't want the reader to hear my voice because my authorial voice will come through and a very dominant personality too. Um, I would never have guessed that. <laughs> right? I, I know. <laughs> so, so that's already one difference, that you're actually hearing their voice, um, their ways of saying things. Um, and the other thing that's different, too, is that um, in the introduction that I'll read you a, a little bit from, uh, I do state the fact that I am the outsider looking in. I am the outsider looking in with a, a clear lens, um, nonpartisan, um, and I can't visit to take any political side, or even though I have my own uh, preferences and, and my own beliefs. I can't visit to do that because I cannot visit to be a Hawaiian. But yeah. don't feel bad about it because yeah. if you're an outsider looking in, maybe you see things that an insider would totally. not see. And, and that's exactly what I feel. And let's stretch that a little bit. I also think that that is why a lot of the women feel comfortable with me. I like to think so because I state my ground that I'm not going to take sides. I am not, um, I don't know if your history is with this person or that person. 
Um, so I'm going to just report the story most objectively based on all the facts and figures and data that I collect um, and based on the things that you tell me. Robert Heinlein, a fair witness. That's what we want from you, a fair yes. witness. So read your part of, in the introduction that okay. you Okay, I, I would like to think that every part is worth reading, but since I only have 30 seconds. So while no two stories are alike, what is common in all these diverse accounts is the overwhelming sense of overcoming. These women unabashedly share what they had to undergo to get to where they are today. The climb can be arduous and unglamorous and not always natural, but what does make it beautiful is their unyielding passion, their strength and spirit, and staunch belief that things will always get better. They have embraced challenges, pain, taken a step in the back, taken a face, a slam of the door, and they all somehow find the courage to say in their own way, okay, if this is how the world rolls, this is how I will rock and roll. They have never allowed their circumstances to define them and instead saw it as a challenge to overcome. None of them used the victim card. Oh, boo-hoo, poor me. It, it's my parents' fault. It's my ex-husband's. It's my soon-to-be baby. It's my future lover's fault. None, zilch, nada. They instead all had a similar rallying cry. Whether I like it or not, this ball is in my court. So what can I do? So either consciously or unconsciously, these women have all marched to the beat of their own drums, and in so doing, crafted their own personal worldviews, distinct life philosophies, created their own style of authentic leadership, are true beacons of light, worthy of being exalted as inspiring women in their own right. Is it true that you were a shy, retiring child? Oh, Loretta? yes. Yes, you can, have, you can call my mom, and she will definitely back you up on that. I'm sure she'll let us know. <laughs> no, my mommy just adored me and she said, go on and be the brightest, most, biggest bundle of joy you can possibly be. And I'm everyth burns, yeah. I, I, I am everything that I am today because of my parents. I mean, they love me so much, you know, and yeah. yeah that's so, very nice, yeah, very nice. Family is so important. Oh, so you. let's talk about some of the people in your book. Yes, sir. Okay, let's talk about Connie Lau first. <laughs> because, yeah. uh, you know, she's the yeah. CEO of uh, HEI things, yeah. and uh, had a tremendous influence in this community. Mm -hmm and in the business community too. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what did you capture from your um, discussion with her? What did you write about with regard to Connie Lau? I mean, first off, obviously I was humbled and honored that Connie Lau, who like pretty much, you know, is CEO of Half of Hawaii, <laughs> <laughs> uh, would agree to speak to this unknown um, girl. But what I really took away is her sense of humility and of the biggest lesson that I think she embodies and shares is the art of listening. Um, she said that one of the biggest lessons that she learned um, when she was a fairly young leader doing the board of trustees or the, 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 the trust um, issue um, was about listening. That there were many parties who were very upset and very angry. Um, and she really learned that listening uh, was the most important. Mm. And the other thing that she shares is uh, the importance of service leadership. In fact, I asked her, I said, if you had to write a book, what do you think it would be about? And she said, I think it'll something about being a servant leader. Well, let's go to that for a minute, because yeah. that's a thread, you know, at least in all of the uh, sure. interviews in this book, mm -hmm. and maybe in some of the others, too. Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what is leadership uh, in your perception of it? Yeah. Uh, what, did you, what did you learn from Connie Lau and others about it? In a community which we have a lot of people who are elevated to high places. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who occupy very special, mm -hmm. uh, important positions in the community, but uh, it's not clear that we have a lot of leaders. Yep. Sometimes one is not the other. Um, you could argue that Connie Lau is, is definitely a leader, and as I said before the show, which you liked so much when I said this, is that women make very good leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I said that, I did okay. say that. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, what did you learn about leadership in your discussion with Connie? I think in discussion with her and other women and, and just through experiencing life as well, that leadership is not a position. I think you very rightly said so. It's not a position. It is not being the boss. But a leader is able to, I think first and foremost, put themselves in the positions of other people, um, not just their staff and employees, but the community, to be able to see a diverse, distinct, um, sometimes even uh, completely uh, conflicting points of view. And a leader must be able to heal, must be able to see both sides and bring them both to the table. 
A leader must not be afraid to shy away from dissension or argument. It's not to say I shy away and I, let's pass on the buck to someone else and get them to solve the problem for me, but to recognize that it is going to be messy, but the leader takes charge um, and yet has, has the foresight to think further, has the hindsight to think about the context and where we have come from, uh, but also have, so have the depth of understanding of the situation or situations and circumstances, but also have peripheral vision to be able to see all points of view and bring them all together. I hope you're making notes about this because it's very important. We need leaders in the community and every word is re relevant here. Loretta is telling you some very valuable lessons. What about courage? What about boldness? Um, you know, what about those traditionally masculine traits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that people expect from leaders? Mm, absolutely. And I mean, first off, I mean, to, just to speak as a woman, I mean, over the weekend, my husband and I went to Straub to see our PCP, and my husband freaked out and said, can you please have the PCP to not take the needle to, to me? I can't, I can't do blood. First off, women bear children. Again, I'm, I'm not being biological. Well, this, you heard it here. <laughs> you write that down, too. And not being essentialist, but <laughs> if there is any person living or otherwise that can take blood, it's women. We all come from a mother. I mean, we can say we came from a Petri dish or, you know, we're uh, artificially inseminated, but uh, for most of us, uh, we all have a mother. Uh, how we choose to later on regard this woman that bears us or gave birth was a different thing. But, by, but all of us have a mother, which, which goes back to if there's any living person that can deal with blood and pain. Uh, and back then, no epidural, let's put it in context, um, it would be women. Um, but that aside, um, I think just, again, at risk of sounding essentialist, and, and, and I most certainly don't want to do that, I think because of the role that women play in society, we have to multitask. We have to be the disciplinarian. We have to be the nurturer. Um, and in modern day societies, we do have to go out and work and, and, and bring home the bacon as well, especially in Hawaii. I mean, you typically have two working parents. Um, so all these roles require women to have a depth of uh, vocabulary, um, to be able to handle all these different situations, whether at work, um, at play, at home, manage the husband and manage the child. And well, we need leadership. We need communities we to come together. Yeah. We need to be focused. Yeah. Uh, and we need leaders that we can trust. Yes. And, and possibly we haven't spent enough time with women on that regard. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think your, your book has a, a sort of a larger significance, especially in these times yes. when leadership is so important and, and so needed, not only here in Hawaii, but you know, in the U.S. mainland and in Europe the world. and everywhere. Yeah. So uh, I really think you're onto something. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're out of time, but I think it's actually a good segue to say, if you want to know more, if you want to know more about women in this community, and uh, there's so many more, I mean, just the ones that I was going to ask mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Uh, uh, Maisie Hirono, mm -hmm. Kathy Inoue, mm -hmm. Rayatea Helm, who was here recently, right. uh, Punani Burgess, uh, yeah. Maya Sartoro Ng, yeah. who is the sister of Barack Obama. Yes, who is very well oh. loved, yeah. All of these people, important that we should know them yes. and see them as leaders and find out how they think and how you think about them. So the point is, on October 21st, hide the hence, <laughs> get on Amazon uh, and, uh, and, and take a look at the book because uh, there are 24, I get that right? There are 24, 24 women yeah. leaders in the book you can learn from. That's right. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you, sir. And uh, during the break, you also did say we can do a musical on the women. So we're going to get Jay to do that together with us. OK, <laughs> we're going to make this book into a musical. She's got you know, theater uh, experience. So like I'm not we'll do that at Leewood. Yeah, we'll all be down. Thank you, Loretta Chen. Thank really, you, Jay. Really I, I appreciate you. Good luck on the book. Thank you very Aloha. much. Aloha. <laughs>